Just that who uh, in the room are majoring in entrepreneurship or fashion or business, and you have your ideas and what you want to do, some projects you've been working on over the year. So, um, my <laughs> name is Cheryl Mosey, and um, I actually got a little started late in my career. I have a, uh, a degree in engineering, and I used to work for Lockheed Martin years ago. Uh, and I was laid off, and I started um, a nonprofit group. Uh, a nonprofit organization where I work with student parents in college. I help them pay for childcare while they uh, were in school. And then when the economy crashed, I kind of was trying to figure out my next step. And that's when I started my uh, business, Minky Blue. And I'm going to stop right there because you said to introduce yourself, but I was here to go deep in. <laughs> so I uh, right. stop there. All right. Hi guys, uh, my name is Abun Ololoye. Uh, I was born in Nigeria. Then my family decided when I was 10 years old to move to, to New Jersey. Uh, so I grew up playing soccer. I'm very passionate about soccer. And I went to Temple University where I studied architecture. Go Owls. Uh, <laughs> and uh, my junior year, I kind of decided I turned 21 and I sort of you know, was thinking of what am I going to do with my life when I graduate college? I didn't really get a job. And so I started um, a brand called Live Beat Football. Uh, it was kind of my way of sort of marrying my passion for soccer. My love for designing and making clothing. Uh, I started making t-shirts when I was in high school. I got a paint shirt to sell to my friends, and that's kind of how I made, made pocket change. Um, so I started the brand when I was 21, made 21 t-shirts, and I was surprised they sold out of like a towel and like a later. And I was like, this is pretty cool. So from there, I just kind of kept making shirts. And six years later, seven years later, here, here we are. I was there when he sold those 21 shirts. By the way. <laughs> yeah, we go way back. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, so tell us more about Minky Blue. What is it, and what what made you start it? Right. So um, as I mentioned, I used to run a nonprofit organization, and I raised money to help uh, low income moms in college pay for childcare. And so I would see the moms struggling with their diaper bag, their book bag, and their purse. And I was going to work every day. I had my my uh, purse, my laptop bag, and my lunch. So I was commuting with two or three bags, and I was like, man, there's got to be a bag out there where I can organize all of my stuff in the bag, still you know, have a stylish bag. And um, so I, I went shopping, trying to find this bag that I had in mind, and I couldn't find it. And so I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to make me a bag. And that was basically it. I had, as you mentioned, I mean, as I mentioned, I had no background in fashion or merchandising. It was really this idea about organizing my items in the bag. And so when I first started, um, since I had worked with the moms, I initially said I was going to do a baby bag because I had connections with moms and daycare centers. And, uh, and so I originally wanted the name pinky blue for mom, baby, it made sense. But the domain is was taken. It's crazy trying to find a regular domain name. And I like the sound of pinky blue. So I wanted to um, stick with it. And I literally went through the alphabets and I said, Linky Blue? Nah. Kinky Blue? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Minky Blue? Yeah, I kind of like it, and that, that was really how I came up with the name, um, Minky Blue. It's catchy. I like it. It's like really cute. All right. Uh, you kind of touched on it a little bit, so yeah. how about you share how exactly you, you got started? What is it, and how exactly you got started? With it? Yeah, so so for me at the time, uh, you know, I was 19, 20 in college, and you know, I played soccer every day. All my buddies played soccer. And I remember thinking to myself, like, man, like, why is there no, like, one, functional apparel for soccer players, uh, and two, like, stylish apparel. Like, you know, I'm a big fan of Ralph Lauren. Like, I grew up, like, all I was polo growing up. And then at the time, I never just, I would see any t-shirts related to soccer. It was very cheesy. Like, the graphics were terrible, and the clothes they were, like, look or feel them. So, for me, that was, like, the big idea behind LBF. But also, it's really a lifestyle brand. Like, we make clothes, we do fashion, um, but 
it's really like a way of a platform for people to express their passion for football, right? So we have a podcast that we do. We uh, have a soccer team, a local soccer team here. We sponsor two different soccer teams in Canada. Um, so the brand kind of sort of is a lot bigger than just, um, hey, we make some clothes and then we sell clothes and we try to make, we make money doing that way. It's more of like expressing this lifestyle that I was living as a college student at some point. I'll skip class to play soccer. I'll play. I remember the day. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend doing that. Um, I remember I skipped my midterm review one year to watch a soccer game, and I didn't think anything about that. I didn't care about the end of class. So I was like, well, I have something with this passion because if I, if I keep going this way, I'm just going to be a failure in life. Uh, so, so that's kind of how you got to get behind the brand. And it's evolved over the last six years. We've kind of started with t shirts and went to like you know, scars and things like that. And now we're actually making our own fabrics and making our own products from the ground up. So. Yeah, it's kind of been a sort of long understanding process. So, what's the first thing you did when you knew that this had to be a business? Uh, it was a hobby for a long time, to be perfectly honest with you. Like, I did it for a year and a half before I even, like, got an LLC, got a DIN number, registered. Like, it was just like, yeah, I'm selling some t shirts and I made some side money. I was like, okay, wait, like, there's too much money coming in. Okay, what was the first thing you did when you decided, okay, this has to be business? Yeah, so um, one of the things that people will mention to you when you start a business or any product is that does it solve the problem? And um, so, it, so I felt that Minky Blue solved the problem and not just I had, but a lot of women had with carrying stuff around, especially for you to uh, to work. And so I did a lot of research. I decided, okay, I'm going to do this. So I researched. I went to um, Google University, YouTube University. <laughs> I did um, small business development. I networked a lot. I read a lot, talked to people who were in the business, and, and decided, you know, from my research that I was going to do it. And um, I learned, you know, I actually started doing patent researches because I felt that it was very unique to the, the handbag industry. And I spent a long time looking at patents and decided that I was going to file a patent also. And um, in 2016, I was issued a utility patent for the bag, for the design, for the utilitarian part of the bag. So we had three types of uh, patents that you get, and um, so design is one, um, then utility is another one, and another one is around um, like plants and things like that. So I was able to get a utility patent. So I'm really excited. How long was that process? Um, about three to four years. Yeah. How much did that cost you? I think, you know, it, it can, mine is non-mechanical, it's not a tech, which can be thousand, you know, maybe ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. So mine doesn't have any technology in it, um, and it still can be a lot of money, eight to $10,000. So I actually researched different boutique uh, patent offices in the city, and so, you know, you, you just really have to do the research, and so I wound up paying about Five to six thousand for my pack. That's really good. It, which is really good. Yeah, and but you know what? I um I wrote a lot of my pack. I read. I studied them. I figured out how to write them. And so by the time I sent it to the patent attorney, was when it was written, so I was able to get that price. So yeah. can you tell us about your process? What does it look like? You design stuff. So business. Ships. What goes into this? It's a, and you can attest to manufacturing too, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's it's um it's a pretty big process. Um. So when I originally started, I wanted to, it to be made in the U.S. And so I started researching U.S. manufacturers, and I learned that um, just for labor alone, I found a few factories in the U.S. that would take on the bag, number one, and that the cost just for labor would be between about $98 to $108 for labor. 
and then I would have to buy the hardware and materials. So it was expensive to get it made here. Um, and then to, to get a sample made here for the type of bag that I had, I have a bag I'll pass it around. For the type of bag that I had for a sample, they wanted two to three thousand dollars just for a sample. So I was kind of forced to go overseas because as a small startup, not really having a lot of money, I think went overseas and that that was that's a process in and of itself too. It's a long process. Yeah, uh, so for us, it's, it's kind of been, like I said, it's been evolutionary. So we started with t shirts where we just source blank t shirts from a local supplier. Yeah, we grab 100 shirts from like Kodak and Rose or Next Level, and we'll have, have a local screen print and put graphics on the shirt and sell them. And what started to happen is I was noticing people were like, oh my god, your shirts are so comfortable. And I felt guilty. I was like, well, I had nothing to do with how soft the shirt is or like how it fits. So I knew we had to start making our own products from scratch to do a cut. So, um, so. I moved, I lived in Seattle for a year, and I met a guy who played soccer with him. His mom owns a factory in China. We started talking, so she made the first batch of pants and jackets that we did. So, like, you know, I went to architecture school, so I knew how to design a big, the research, how to do tech back and stuff. So, I made a tech back with a jacket and a pen, and then I was able to get manufactured that way. And then, since then, we worked with a few different factories, and actually, one of the factories we're in now is uh, owned by the parents of another student that goes here, Harsha, who's a grad student here. So any of you know Harsha? He's in like the GFE program. So Very quiet. Yeah, he's really quiet, but Harsha met him at one of our events here, and I guess this is what happened now. Yeah, and, and you know, to speak to like manufacturing overseas, it's one local U.S. manufacturer could make the kind of things we were trying to make. Um, not even just the you know, cost effectively, could make it period. And then going to China, the sampling is a lot cheaper. Um, the only problem is the lead times are longer, right? You have to ship a sample across. You know, even doing FedEx was like 20 bucks each time plus. Sampling cost, but for me, all that cost gets eaten up into like the bulk order a lot of times. So you kind of throw that into your cost, like your price, price your product. So it's definitely been a long process because never when you start, you go, I want to make something, I want to make a jacket, for example, right? But then throughout the process, you learn there's logistics you have to figure out, there's customs you have to figure out. You got to figure out, okay, when do I need to start making this jacket so by the time it gets to my door, I can market it and ship it in time. The jacket showed up on my doorstep in the spring or summertime, it doesn't really help. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to sort of adjust your entire business process to, you know, to fit that, that, that encounter. And another thing is, you know, I now know the holidays of China and India because, hey, we're not working for the next two weeks of like COVID, so like, I can't get anything made. And just, that's just part of the process of doing business with the uh, you know, factories overseas. Have you had to form any partnerships that have been vital or helpful for your business? Absolutely. Um, you know, again, I don't, I don't know how to do a tech pack. And I don't know how to do a lot of things. So a lot of times when we feel like we don't know how, it's like, you know, when I started the business, I was like, I know nothing about designing bags. I know nothing about manufacturing. And a lot of times when we want to do something, we allow fear to set in because we say we don't know how. So what I do is that I find people who know how so that I can get to the next step. So I partner with somebody that could do a tech bank for me. Um, and then I've gotten to the point where I've been working with my factory for two years so they know the design. So now, even though I don't know how to draw, I draw. <laughs> And then, but they, you know, we go back and forth, they get it. I had um, Nicholas draw. Nick is my intern right here. He was drawing for me. Um, so we kind of figure it out as we go and not allow um, the fact that I don't know how to do that to stop because you can figure it out. There are people out there that know more than you know. And so I partner with the people that can help me get the job done. So it's a, I have a lot of different partners. Yeah, um, so we've been very lucky to be in a very niche and very specific industry, right? Like we only make soccer products, we only manage, you know, to market our products to soccer people. Um, so as far as partnerships go, um, we recently worked with some professional soccer teams to do capsule collections for them. So we worked with Major League Soccer and uh, Sport in Kansas City last year to do a six piece collection. So the idea behind the collection is, you know, we're going to design and make something for you that your fans and supporters can't get anywhere else, right? Because typically, Fan gear is very like black 
get a great t-shirt, you put the team's logo on it, and you sell it, you might get a hoodie or something like that. But like, well, what if you added some more functional bits to it, maybe kind of more streetwear, have sort of a more cool and sort of more current aesthetic? So that's a good partnership that's been working for us. Um, we sort of partner with soccer.com. So they're the largest soccer retailer in the world, so they carry some more product as well. Uh, then I'll sell it, you know, we're going to uh, launch a UK office for our great business uh, in the fall. So that's another partnership that we're working on right now. So it's just one after another business. It's all fun. Oh, recently worked with Adidas uh, the last yeah, couple of months. Um, so they actually reached out to us and said, hey, we love what you guys are about, and we kind of how you guys are see so we didn't really do a panel for them necessarily it's more so like take kind of our creative spin on soccer and our, and our you know, approach to the game and put together two activations to kind of like you kind of come out and it's like you know we build stuff we done stuff we have DJs come out and local artists do stuff and it's kind of it's been cool and fun and you went to Philly right? Yes okay. two years ago. <laughs> we got an alum here too so that's pretty cool. Um, um, let's talk about funding. Um, how did you get started? How much did it cost you? And what did the fund go to? So, um, my family, we were funding for the business. Um, I've been approached by two angel investors of the, since the time I started the business. Um, I declined it at that time because I felt that I needed, I, it was too early in my business to accept and I was, it was a lot that I didn't know and I was making a lot of mistakes. Um, at this time, I feel like I'm ready. Um, those investments we early on. So my my family, we've been funding the business. I won't say how much. It's a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that really went to manufacturing. You know, you just you have to have that money to to get um, jump start on your business. Yeah. Um, so the first twenty one shirts, my sister paid for. It. Hundred and sixty bucks. Uh, she gave me for that. And then I think we had like 200 bucks from that back to get more shirts. And that's kind of how we've been going since then. Um, now we have a few sort of small investors, just people who are, they've been customers of ours for years. And they were like, hey, like, I love what you guys are doing. Like, I have $20,000. What can I do? And I'm like, okay, you buy the product and everything. So, it's that. Uh, so we've had a few people help out. We raised a Kickstarter. Uh, we had a Kickstarter campaign in 2016. We raised $32,000. Through that, so it's pretty much mostly just those two people that kick started just like whatever money that comes in, we put that right back into expanding the business. We haven't taken any sort of like VC money or anything. Cool. Um, and feel free to chime in if you have questions. Um, yeah. Uh, so, in terms of growing your customer base, how have you done that? So, um, we do Facebook ads. I do newsletter, um, I do pop-ups on my website so people can sign up for the newsletter so we get it that way. And then word of mouth, I do conferences, um, events and things like that, you know, to throw, to throw my, my emails. Uh, so similar to her, we use Facebook ads quite a bit and we've found some success with that. Social media is really good for us, we're a very visual brand. So that's kind of how we tell the brand story. I think a lot of people like the brand story, they love the brand story, so that's been helpful. And then just, you know, word of mouth is a way where people love our brand so much. If you have our logo tattooed on them, it's pretty crazy. So that's like free advertising right there. Um, and just, you know, once we find something, we have a very, very specific like, customer. Uh, we have a profile of that customer that is typically male between you know, 18 and 35 that plays soccer X amount of times a year. So as you find those people, they typically have friends that are just like them, <coughs> and it kind of like spreads, spreads that way. What would you say is working for your business right now in terms of helping you grow? Um, definitely just, you know, creating awareness of social media. People buying the bags and telling their friends about it, tagging them. Um, we did, uh, we, I actually partnered with a couple of groups last year. Uh, I try to be very creative in who I identify uh, to sell the bags to. And I 
sold bags to a golf invitation, a celebrity golf invitation, and they bought a few hundred bags to give out to the golfers and the wives and the family. So I look outside the box and spell in the bag. We also partnered with um, the American Breast Cancer Foundation under the interior lining uh, pink. And so it's, it's forming those alliances, getting people to talk about their brand um, and building that, that awareness. What's working for you right now? Uh, so I think at this stage, it's, it's two main things. It's one, our reputation, right? we've been around for almost seven years, and I think most small businesses go ahead and don't last that long. So now we're able to work with bigger clients and sort of form bigger partnerships because we've been around for such a long time. And I think just with our products now, our products are so dialed in and so specific to our customer base that they know, okay, well, they spend a little bit more to get our products, but they're not going to get a single product like a that. Um, that builds loyalty. And once you have, so you know, for me, I always say, if someone comes to buy something from you one time, they're not your customer. If they come twice, it's like they try to confirm it. And then the third time is when you know you have a multiple buy. So we have customers that spend thousands of dollars a year for our products. I think our average product costs seventy eight dollars That's a lot of time for a lot of people every year. So that's the core of our business, and that's what we focus on. Um, it's hard to get someone off the street to come into this class because we go bought from you. Have you had any major setbacks or what's been a major challenge for you with your business? I mean, growing is a challenge, right? Every, you know, when, we, when our society thinks about success, we think of all the flashy things that comes with that, but growing a business is hard, right? Staying where you are is easy because you already know what your processes are, you know exactly what works. <laughs> when you try something new and you expand, like, that's hard, that's challenging. When we expanded, you know, you know pants and jacket the first time, we paid thirteen thousand dollars to get you know a few thousand, hundred, you know, two thousand pairs of pants that just the fact we cheaped out on the mesh and we do our and do is like, do we sell these pants to these effective pants to customers? Or do we take that the hell and just try to figure out the work on that? Right? Like that could have killed our business. Luckily we didn't, but these are the realities of growing a business, right? We expand and walk into new territory, we have no idea how things are gonna go. Um, so that's definitely mm -hmm. Yeah, you, there are always challenges. I mean, as long as you stay in business, it's always something that's going to happen. And uh, manufacturing is a big issue. The same happened uh, with Minky Blue when I first started. You know, because I didn't know anything about choosing materials and hardware and, and not following up with the factory because I'm really relying on them to give me the best materials and it's going to hold up. So, um, yeah, when I first launched, I had defective bags. And that cost me a lot of money because, number one, I ordered more bags than what I should have as a startup. And number two, I, um, I just didn't know about the process. I hadn't visited the factory or anything. So um, that set me back. I really had to start all over and I could have just stopped because I lost a lot of money. But I was too deep in, I, I couldn't, um, you know, it was my family money, and so I had to really work my way out, and it's taken a long time. As a matter of fact, last year was the first time I saw some real numbers because it was really about starting all over. So anytime you're in a business, you never know what's gonna come your way, what kind of challenges, what failures you're gonna have, but it's what, you know, how you figure out how to work around those things and how you push through it that's going to help you uh, to be successful. What would you say, so what's next for you? What's the vision for the future? Yeah, I have a couple of things that um, are happening um, that I'm working on. One is a, a different line for HSN, Home Shopping Network. I'm working uh, on a line of bags for, for that market. And also, I've been talking to um, Target for a couple of years, so we're talking about doing um, private labeling. So one of the things for me, my bags are um, like 172 to 188 dollars. So that's not going to sell in Target, right? 
So you have to be flexible and you have to figure it out. Like if they want your bag, they and they said we want your bag. How would how do I make that work where I'm not cheapening my bag and the you know the people that already bought it at that price? I don't want them to be able to go to Target. So I had to I, I had to figure some stuff out to make that work. And so we you know we we're, we're, we're doing that. I, we did it. <laughs> it's coming. And it's, yeah, it's coming. I'm pretty excited about it. We changed. You won't get the same level of functionality that I currently have. have on, like, they won't get my package bag, but they'll get something similar so that there's still a difference um, in the bag, and you'll know that there's a difference. And, of course, the private labeling won't be minky blue. Um, so that's the process that I'm working through and being flexible so that I'm not turning down deals that could potentially, you know, give me a lot of money. So you have to figure, you have to gotta figure it out. Don't say no. I've said no a couple of times. I'm like, hey. <laughs> um, just gotta figure it out this kind of way. Great question. Did you approach Target or did they approach you? Now, so one of the things that um, I do in my business, so a lot of times people say because of the price, well, why aren't you, you know, Neiman or Macy's or what have you. So what I've learned over the years is that as a startup, uh, it's pretty, first of all, it's pretty difficult to get in those stores as a startup. Number two, when you do retail at um, that level, there are a lot of fees associated when you're selling to those big box stores. And if you don't sell, they're like buyback fees or they want to put your stuff on sale. So there are a lot of different fees. And when you're starting up, really when you start looking at the numbers, I couldn't afford it. I really couldn't afford it. So I focused on direct to customer. Um, the reason why I like the target idea is because it's private label. That means they would, they would put their name on it and I don't have to push the brand so much. Um, and then understanding what you know what that is along along the process. Um, so did I answer the question? Oh, you were the Oh yeah. Uh, so what I do is I go to these business conferences um, for women-owned businesses and minority-owned businesses. And so there are a lot of companies that. Uh, do businesses, women-owned businesses, so there's supply and diversity. So I make it my business every year to go to these big conferences, and you have Fortune 500 companies there that want to work with minority-owned businesses. So you'll have everybody there from, if you're doing Toyota, to the Marriott's, to Target, to Walmart, to you know all different kinds of stores because they're looking for them. So I make my way. So for the last couple of years, I've been making my way to talk to these different um, stores and suppliers. That might be a, something you want to try, too. What's next for the three people? What's that vision? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier we're expanding the brand to, to Europe, so we're going to open an office and warehouses in the UK. Um, just because, you know, software is huge overseas. Um, it's, it's grown in America, I've seen it grow, uh, but it's just already massive overseas that we're trying to capture that market. So, Having a base out there in office we can kind of operate out of there, um, working with more teams. Uh, we've done success with building house teams. Like it's a lot of money up front, and uh, some more teams are interested in building with us and expanding that part of our business. Um, but then also just, you know, kind of expanding the brands and become a creative agency of sorts as well. Like, these hired us next to the clients that have more when you start out with. So, those three things, like working with your team and apparel. Um, Doing more creative agency stuff like big brands and then you know, come to the office and be good. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for all of you guys, it's, it's important to not look at us as people that where we are is attainable, right? It just takes a lot of time, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and a vision for where you, where you really like to be. And, you know, I was where you guys were when I was 20, 21, and I wish I had something like this. Where I kind of just like figured it out myself step by step, right? So I think for you guys, don't feel like anything you have in mind, any of your dreams, it's impossible or too big. Just kind of take one, you know, one bite out of it at a time and have 
Yeah, and I would just say that, um, you know, don't allow fear. Fear is always going to be there every step of the way, but don't allow it to keep you from doing what you want to do. Um, you just got to figure out how to get past it, how to get through it, and find people who, do, who can help you get to the next step. So I'd be curious to know what kind of are we, are we opening for questions? We're opening up. Okay. Yep. <laughs> to know what kind of businesses that you're interested in and if you um, what steps you've taken or are you still, you know, in the idea of college or anybody. <laughs> so Evan, you said that you use uh, Kickstarter to fundraise. What tips would you recommend? For Kickstarter specifically? Yeah, Kickstarter. Um, so I think the campaign is one before we even like launch. Uh, we did, we spent two months just prepping the campaign. We figured out we could pull our contacts so my close friends, acquaintances, people I like met in college, like everyone I'd ever met in my life. We reached out to them before the campaign, so I said, hey, this thing's going to happen. Uh, we built up that buzz. So the idea is the day you launch, you have enough momentum that Kickstarter starts featuring the stuff you want. Um, if you don't get 25% of your goal in the first 48 hours, you're probably not going to reach that goal. So like, that's something to keep in mind. It's just like the work happens before uh, the campaign starts. Um, what was your first prototype? Like you have to have a prototype. Right? Yeah, so we had done, so we had gotten a production sample of this is what the jacket and the pants were going to look like. And then we did photo shoots, we did a video based on it, spent a lot of time doing graphics, like passing feedback, and then sort of create a solid campaign and then Any other questions? Is anyone working on any ideas for class that they think could be something real later in life? Yeah. It's not like something that necessarily you don't ever know. I'll say that, but I think it's funny because we just did a project in one of our classes that presented doing a bag for commuters. And we're doing an act but wear line also goes for commuters. So we made an entire person that you know, not project, but we did a mock up of it. Follow through that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's why so we're making a backpack this year too. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so we um so I bought one in the bag. If you um, get a chance to go on my website, which is minkyblue.com. Um so so yeah, so you know, we talked about the um, the three bags when you usually carry it. Um, your purse. Uh, yeah, that's. I'll just hold it there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes you know we take out shoes and we'll put it in a big tote bag, and we're always digging for everything. So I just wanted to be able to organize my items. So on the top part of the bag. The purse essentials go here. It's a, it's a panel here. And then I can put my laptop, and I'm going to pass this around so you guys can see it. But I can put my laptop or reading material here. So this is the pocket number one. Purse essentials and things go on the top here. And I usually drop my phone here. And I kind of have different styles. I have a tote bag as well. And then on the back, I can um, hold this down. I can carry my lunch or my toiletries. All of my bags come with an insulated bag. So I can put my lunch in here or my toiletries or my makeup or anything like that. And then when I'm not carrying this, I'll put my shoes in here, uh, my workout gear, a sweater, or anything like that. Overnight, um, if I'm doing an overnight trip. So I have that. And then... Where the patent comes in is I have this divider on the inside. So you can see I have a top compartment here and a bottom compartment here. So there's a divider, and if I unzip this panel here, I can lay this down, lay it flat, and transform it into a full work bag. So then it becomes like an you know, overnight bag. So I always say that it's a bag that works for you because I can... You know, very functional, very versatile, and I can carry it however I want to carry it. It's not just one big open bag where I'm digging inside. 
So it's pretty cool. So I have um, I have this style. I have a couple of styles. I have a tote bag style on my website, and of course, you know, women love it because especially the shoe part, the shoe compartment. <laughs> we always have a place to put our shoes. So I will pass this around. Let you guys check it out. Um, but yeah, just it was basically an idea. And I did, don't know how to sew or anything. I said I didn't know how to draw. So what I did, ironically, we talked about Target. I actually went to Target and bought a bag for $29.99. And I let it sit there for a while because I couldn't bring myself to cut up this $30 bag that I just bought. But I eventually cut it up. And I, you know, I just kind of figured out how I wanted to look. And um, in retrospect, I really wish I had gone to the thrift store and bought a big bag and cut it up. But I really just, you know, take things. I had a stapler and tape and cardboard, and I kind of put this little thing together. And it took a while, a lot of iterations for me to get that patent part piece together. Um, I had went through a lot of different designs and things, but um, I stuck with it and then we came up with this. Yes. Are there uh, other like bag styles or um, brands that you drew inspiration from? So I would say to me because I like the nylon and they consider themselves like a work bag, a travel bag. Um, so I do like the to me brand. So I, you know, priced it around the to me brand. There's another brand that was, um, I also consider like competitors but also look at all the time. It's called Dagny Dover. And they are graduates from um, Wharton. They did like the, um, the bag, the work bag too. But I will say none of those bags have the compartment type um, things in the bag. Any other questions? So that's what comes out in an idea. So never uh, limit yourself because of your, you know, what you think you can or cannot do. You never know when it will grow to be. Yes. Did you imagine yourself becoming this like photo and having an actual like prototype bag? No, it was nothing that I had dreamed of when I was younger. To you know. And it took me a while to adopt the fact that I'm a handbag designer because it's <laughs> not nothing I thought about. But um, you know, I can see how I use my engineering skills in the bag itself. So I enjoy it. I enjoy the the challenges. I enjoy solving problems. I enjoy figuring things out and making them work. Um, it's definitely not easy. Um, I enjoy it in the after, not when I'm going through, but after, after. Yes. Would you ever consider doing like a men's bag? Yeah, we're working on that for this year. We're working on a diaper bag too. So, you are walking. Right, I didn't mean to close so where I'm. So, how about you get up and show us what's sure. going on? Sure. Um, <laughs> What's going on here? So everything I'm wearing except for my sneakers, obviously, are um, the stuff that we make, so the socks, um, the pants. The base, the pants is something you can wear kind of casually like this, but it's also like performance for the sock and the active. Um, the hoodie is something we make because cut ours. It's kind of a really cool like, zip to the pocket. You can put whatever you want in there. Um, it's got thumb holes, so it gets cold out. Um, what else? The hat is just like a simple like, yeah, cap that we make right now. Uh, yeah, it's pretty much it. We make a bunch of cool stuff. Um, kind of our marquee product right now is like our micro jacket. It's basically a jacket that has like a face mask built into it. So you play soccer with it, like a hood kind of like black behind you. Um, so yeah, it's like kind of an offset zipper, like sort of different like performance detail that works just for soccer players. Like runners like it a lot. To people that cycle and run the same leather jacket as well. We designed it just for soccer players because that's the market that we focus on. Um, yeah, um, I'm sorry, I forget your name. Okay. Okay, okay. Um, so it seems like from what you were saying, like the majority of your sales are online. Is that correct? Yes. So do you see yourself like expanding to in stores or not? 
Um, so we have some stores that carry our products, um, as specialty, soccer specialty stores across the world that carry stuff. Um, but I personally wouldn't open a brick and mortar store just because I think the world is moving in the opposite direction. Um, it's just too much of a risk. <coughs> a website costs 30 bucks a month, but like a store costs 50 grand a month. So um, maybe at some point we'll do like some kind of flagship that has, that's more than just a store. Um, a lot of like, um, some brands I like have like stores that also have coffee shops and things like that. So maybe in the future I'll do something that's some sort of hybrid, uh, but I would just open a store just to say I have a Would you think about like branding your own, um, like, like whether it's like uniforms or gigs or like balls or things like that? Yeah, so we're working on, um, so we do the jerseys for my soccer team. Uh, we designed those, we do jerseys for a few other teams um, in Canada as well. Um, and as far as balls, I definitely want to do some sort of branded products as well. last questions thank you all for coming uh, you can stay behind and ask questions uh, but yeah thank you, thank you.